Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 371 Interview with Thomas McKenna about his book. Moro Warrior. Thomas McKenna is an anthropologist who has lived and worked for years with Moro communities in the Philippines and has spent decades writing and conducting research on their culture and history. He has presented his work on the Moros to Oxford University, the U.S. State Department, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He is the author of Muslim Writers and Rebels and a number of other published works. Mr. McKenna, Thank you for being with us today. I'm very happy to be here. So as you and I were talking a couple of minutes uh, before we started recording, I was telling you that one of the reasons I'm very happy to have you on the show is because I think it was at the beginning of this calendar year where I I was covering the Pacific Theater. I had the Japanese come in. They took over um, the Philippines. They took over some other possessions as well. Uh, but I just kind of stopped right there. And and again, one of the things that I really liked about your book, even though it's kind of zoomed in, it's kind of localized, is, is you keep the story of Mindanao and its resistance going, which is why I wanted to bring you on, uh, which, of course, is a very long-winded way of saying that this book is about, it's about many things, but it's about Muhammad Adil and uh, his incredible life. He's a teenager throughout this entire episode, you know, and you've got the teenager's desire for battle and combat and pitting himself against others. And of course, chasing women as well. We're going to go into that. Of course. But what I realized by the time I finished reading this book is that Muhammad is a combination of Forrest Gump, James Bond and Tarzan <laughs> all combined. This guy was incredible. I was hoping you could tell us how you came by his life story and a little bit about your own background as well. Well, I think you've nailed him there. Um, yes, I, I'd love to tell you. I, I am a cultural anthropologist. Now, that's not um, a typical background for the author of a um, popular uh, World War II history. Right. But I but I think, uh, you know, untapped sources can lead to untold stories. And um, so that's I think uh, also why I'm here. Mm. Uh, anthropologists study tribal peoples, indigenous people, minorities, outsiders. We go to remote locations and, uh, you know, we study traditional lifestyles. Right. And we do it by, by living with the people we're studying, by learning the language, spending time, at least a year in a community. And so that's what I did. I first went to the southern Philippines in 1985 uh, to conduct research for a doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. I was there for almost two years. I did field research among the Moros, who are the uh, who are indigenous or native Philippine Muslims. Right. And I, I lived with the family and the community and learned the language. Now, the Moros had recently fought a war against um, the dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, mm. uh, a defensive war. He had invaded their homeland. And it, that war was... Um, uh, remarkably similar to the current war in, in Ukraine, at least structurally. Uh, right. they, uh, their homeland was invaded by the army of a dictator. It was a very David and Goliath struggle, uh, but they fought the invaders to a standstill. So I was the first researcher allowed in uh, there in 12 years, and I, I went to study the effects uh, of the war on the Moros and, and on their way of life. And that mm -hmm. is where I met Muhammad Adil, who's the main character in the book and the source for many of its stories. 
So we're going to talk about your book. Obviously, we're going to hit the highlights because it's just too much to put into a three or four hour conversation and nobody wants to talk to me that long. <laughs> but it, but if you could, and I know this is an oversimplification, but by the time I finished reading your book, I felt so sorry for these people. They had to deal with the Spanish for hundreds of years and then the Americans and now the Japanese and then uh, Ferdinand Marcos. I mean, they're they're... For generations, they have been defending themselves against either what slaughter or absolute control. Yes, uh, you've you've got that right, and they've certainly had a very challenging uh, 20th century, even more challenging than um, uh, many other peoples. Right. Uh, so they're the they're the native Muslim inhabitants of the Philippines. They're only they're a small minority, only four percent, mm-hmm. but they're concentrated in the in the south uh, in, in the southern Philippines, especially on the large island of Mindanao which is a bit bigger than Ireland. It's, it's really big enough to be its own country. Wow. Uh, that's, that island, it's mountainous. And back in 1942, it was uh, still lightly populated and, and still mostly uh, covered in white rainforest. So, mm-hmm. yes, there are two things that distinguish the Moros from um, the rest of the Philippine population. First, they're the only sizable Philippine population that was never conquered or colonized by the Spaniards. And the Spaniards wow. ruled the Philippines for 350 years. But they're also the only Muslim popula- uh, only Muslim population ever colonized by the United States. So a hundred years ago, the United States possessed a Muslim colony in Mindanao. It was the only one of its kind. It lasted for about 40 years, uh, from about 1902 to 1942. Right. Um, now they had a special. The Moros had a special status uh, in the American uh, colony. In the Philippine possession, mostly because of, of American attitudes about them. Right. Um, if you think about the context, the, the, the Indian Wars of the American West mm-hmm. were, were still a very recent memory for the soldiers, including cavalry, uh, serving in the Philippines. Right. The Spanish-American War started in uh, 1898. That was just eight years after the massacre of Wounded Knee, which essentially ended the, the Indian Wars. When they uh, when they made it to the southern Philippines, uh, those soldiers uh, encountered uh, very familiar sorts of warriors. Right? right, they were dressed. They had colorful battle dress, individual acts of bravery. They fought with swords and lances, and they were led by chiefs. Very very different from what was going on in the north. They had already uh, they had already defeated the army, the Filipino armies in the north, um, who wore uniforms, marched in ranks, were led by generals. Right. Here they went to the south and they found something completely different. So they were, uh, Americans were quite taken with the Moros. Um, popular books were written about them. Mark mm-hmm. Twain wrote about them. Joseph Conrad wrote about them. Wow. But, of course, when they resisted uh, colonization, um, they were treated pretty much the same way as uh, Native Americans. They were called renegades and hostiles. Uh Wow. And when they resisted mm-hmm. uh, the invasion, uh, they were hunted down and they were subjected to massacres that were even worse, even larger than uh, the one at Wounded Knee. Mm-hmm. So the Moral Wars were, were very similar to, um, uh, to the Indian Wars, and they lasted almost 15 years. That, that's incredible. Thank you for that. Before we get to the actual meat of the story, the reason I asked you that, that question just now was because I imagine with all these invaders, they have... I guess a an element of fighting or military prowess has crept into their culture just because it has to. If if you're fighting generation after generation after generation, you know you have to get good at defending yourself or you have to value those kinds of skills. But I did want to ask, and, and if you want to touch on that, please feel free, but I did want to ask when you were there in the 80s, I mean, what one of the many reasons I, I wanted to bring you on is because I wanted the listeners to get a sense of what these people are like. It, it doesn't matter that they're halfway across the world. It doesn't matter that the environment has changed their skin or, or hair or whatever. I imagine that they're people like the rest of us. They have their families. They want peace. They want stability so they can live out their lives. And I was just hoping, I, I, I don't, I'm not even sure what I'm asking, but what, what are these people like? What's their, their day-to-day activities? What are their goals? I just want us to have a sense of what they are before the Japanese come along and absolutely shatter their world. Well, that's a good question. Um, the, they are uh, in, in 1942. Let's say, for example, right. they were they were farmers and fishermen. They were mm-hmm. ordinary folks 
trying to make uh, 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 trying to lead uh, uh, peaceful, uh, normal lives uh, in uh, in their homeland and and to protect their homeland from invaders. They had adjusted to uh, the American occupation. Uh, there were after the the horrors of the uh, of the Moro Wars, uh, the Americans actually treated them. Uh, pretty mildly, and right. there was a, there was also sort of a Pax Americana, so there was l- uh, less less fighting and feuding, and it was it was actually a, a quite a peaceful time, um, a, a relatively peaceful time. Right. Now the there is one interesting thing about about the Moros uh, that again uh, sort of sets them apart is that they have a a core cultural ideal called Muratabat. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, which, um, which was one of the reasons that they were so tenacious in their, in their resistance uh, to right. both the Spaniards and the Americans, and then and now uh, to the Japanese. Now, the, the literal translation of that is dignity, but it also covers um, such English language values as honor, sense of duty. Uh-huh. Now, that, those those kinds of cultural ideas you'll, you'll find everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, of course, you find them in the U.S. military. I remember uh, Douglas MacArthur gave a famous uh, speech in 1962 at West Point called uh, Duty on Our Country. So these are very familiar kinds of um, uh, uh, kinds of cultural ideals. Right. But among the Moros, those ideals were so uh, – that ideal of Murata Bhatt was so deeply held and so meaningful that in some situations it had more value than life itself. Right. So wow. that's why you get these stories from the Moro Wars – of apparent suicide attacks by Moros, and there are there are numerous stories from the Moro Wars, and they're often interpreted uh, by um, uh, by by historians uh, who don't know the Moros well. They're interpreted as a result of Islamic extremism, uh. um, but it was not. They were not Islamic extreme. Uh, the result of Islamic extremism. Uh, mm-hmm. It was the result of Murat Abad. Uh, and that that is an ideal that long predates the coming of Islam to the Philippines. Right. Yeah, I, I enjoyed those little moments in the book where um, Adil wanted to do something, but it was maybe militarily foolish. And everybody else went, no, 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 you can't. Yes, you're the leader, but you can't do that. And <laughs> he, he would get all worked up because, again, he's 17, 18 years old. But he you know, there were times when he did not take advice and it didn't go well. There were times when he took the advice of these more experienced, older warriors and it worked out and you're right, but there is a sense of obligation of duty of honor. And I loved that. And it kept coming up again and again in the story. So I enjoyed that very much. So before we jump into the meat of this, I was hoping you could maybe tell us some of the major players. So we'll have something to hang our hat on as we go through this story. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Muhammad Adil is a main character in the book. He is the moral warrior of the title. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was born in 1925 to uh, a family of noble blood, and he was a grandson of two very famous uh, warriors uh, who had fought both the Spaniards and the Americans. But his father, uh, whose name was Haji Adil Tambis, uh, who was also an important character in the book, his father belonged to the first generation of Moors who had been conquered by the Americans. Right. Uh, his father was born about the turn of the century. And his father didn't want to be a warrior and didn't want him to be a warrior. Mm-hmm. His father went to American schools. He learned English. He became a commercial farmer and a businessman. And he uh, wanted his son to do the same thing. Right. Um, uh, Adil's father uh, had the title of Haji, Haji Adil Tambis, because he was one of the few Moros to make the pilgrimage, uh, the Hajj, to Mecca in the 1920s, right. uh, when Muhammad was three years old. The, the Philippines is very, very far away from Mecca. It's on the entire other, you know, opposite end of the Asian continent. Right. And uh, even then, with steamship, with steam power, the whole trip took more than a year. Oh my and um, his wife, who he dearly loved, he brought her with him to be able to share this uh, this sort of magical trip with him. Mm-hmm. But she... Uh, she accompanied him, but she tragically she died in childbirth in uh, in Arabia, and she never returned her children home. So um, uh, Muhammad Adil uh, lost his mother at the at the age of four. Wow. Uh, the third main character in in Mora Warrior is Edward Cooter, who is an American colonial official mm-hmm. and a um, 
really a rare friend to the Moros during the American colonial period. He was a child of um, evangelical Lutheran missionaries from Pennsylvania, and he actually spent his early years in India at his father's mission. Wow. He graduated from Roanoke College like his father. Uh, in 1922, he signed on to become a school headmaster in the Philippines, which was his father's position in India. Mm-hmm. And he, so he really seemed to be following in his father's footsteps. But the one big difference is that um, Edward Kuda was not interested in saving souls. Right. He, uh, he, uh, there was, and there was actually an unofficial American policy, which was pretty progressive for the time, mm-hmm. um, uh, that was uh, essentially uh, civilizing without Christianizing. They were not seeking oh. to, to uh, proselytize uh, among the Moros and did not uh, encourage any uh, missionaries among the Moros. And Cooter was one of the strongest proponents for that policy and also one of the strongest advocates for the Moros. Now, the, the, um, the central relationship in the book really is the, the friendship between Edward Cooter and, and Muhammad Adil. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though my, for a lot of the book they are many miles or even <laughs> continents apart, it's still right. sort of the key, um, the key relationship. Now, Cooter was Adil's foster father, not in the American sense of the term, mm-hmm. in the formal American sense of the term, but in the Moro uh, sense of the term. So it's, very, it's not uncommon at all for Moro parents to lend their child for a period of time to a relative or a friend uh, if they think it, it, that that would benefit the child. It's, 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 it's fairly common. Right. Well, Muhammad Adil's uh, experience was a little different. He actually ran away from home at the age of 13, <laughs> right. uh, sailed across the Sulu Sea with his, um, oh. uh, distant, with his uh, distant cousin, and uh, he was seeking adventure, but he was also trying to escape this uh, agricultural boarding school his father had sent him to because his father wanted him to become yeah. a commercial father. But Adil hated the, he hated farm work and, and um, didn't like it, didn't like the place at all. So he ran away to this uh, uh, sort of tropical island uh, in the middle of the Sulu Sea. And he shows up on the doorstep, uh, the doorstep of Edward Cooter, mm-hmm. who uh, had been sponsoring boys um, from families who, uh, from poorer families who couldn't afford to send their uh, children to high school. He would uh, spawn, uh, uh, almost no girls went to high school in, right. in the 1930s. Um, he, although they did uh, finish uh, seven years of uh, grade school, but uh, these boys who went on to the few high schools that were available, uh, Cooter would take promising boys and then uh, sponsor their educations. So he had he had boys uh, living with him in his house, and um, Adil's cousin was one of those boys. So. Adil asks Cooter if he can stay. Cooter says he can, but only if his father gives his permission. Right. Uh, Adil writes his father. His father at first refuses, but then he relents because he knows his son is headstrong and <laughs> is not going to go back to this agricultural school anyway. And so well, Adil becomes one of Cooter's favorites and um, stays in his house uh, until uh, for three years until the Japanese invasion, and, and they remain lifelong friends. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. 
That is, as, as you can imagine, uh, for your readers, I fell in love with Edward. Like you said, he, he's not there to, to Christianize. He's, he's selecting normally poor family, you know, boys or poorer families because they can't afford these things. And he's giving them what could be an invaluable education, like, like Tempest himself. You know, he's been Americanized or Westernized, and he sees the writing on the wall. If he can get his son, uh, you know, maybe some of the latest technology when it comes to farming or husbandry or whatever— it will stand him in good stead as he gets older. But of course, all that gets shattered uh, with the Japanese coming to the Philippines. That's so right. let's, let, let's jump into that. So we've had Pearl Harbor December 7th. Now it's December 20th, 1941. The troops of the Japanese Empire, they land on Mindanao. Their job is to obviously secure it, which means pushing into the interior. However, there are resistors waiting. There's four regular battalions and two Moro battalions. And, and this comes across in your book several times. But right away, the um, invaders who have all of these weapons, all of this technology, they have communications, they have everything. The Moros do not have modern weapons. And for a while, they're not given modern weapons by the Americans. I wonder if the Americans maybe didn't quite trust them being Muslim, kind of being outside of the accepted uh, scope of Philippine po uh, politics by 1942. Well, that's exactly right. Um, and the reason they weren't trusted with modern weapons were was because they were so good with them. <laughs> and, and they had shown that effectiveness during the Moro War. So yeah. the Moro Wars were still a recent memory. They'd only ended uh, 20 years earlier. So there were still officers, both American and Filipino officers, who oh, remembered. It's personal. Um, uh, right. Uh, the Moro yeah. Wars. And... Um, but the context is interesting uh, as well. So one of the outcomes of the Moro Wars was that when the Americans finally won, they, they immediately put heavy restrictions on the ownership of firearms among the Moros. Mm -hmm. um, then, so then, then we're in, in 1941, and MacArthur's army that was, has been formed to defend the Philippines, um, the U.S. Uh, Army Forces Far East, or uh, uh, called in the Philippines called USAFE, mm -hmm. um, they were even more poorly equipped than their stateside uh, counterparts. Right. So when it, so when it com comes time to distribute these rare firearms, I think they really only had about one for every two soldiers, mm -hmm. um, the moral volunteers were passed over. In fact, it was decided that they would not be given to moral volunteers. Right. So two American commanders in Mindanao had, then had the idea to form uh, these volunteers into so-called bolo battalions. A bolo is a machete, uh, basically. Right. And... These moral uh, volunteers joined because they wanted to defend their homeland, but also they really hoped that, that they would uh, receive firearms. They didn't think it was a good idea to go fight Japanese tanks and machine guns uh, only with bladed weapons. Uh, they thought they would eventually get guns, uh, but they never did. And the only wow. way they ever they got guns in the end was to take from soldiers who were uh, either surrendering to the Japanese or, or, or uh, walking home to— um, uh, when when the war had been uh, had been lost, but mm -hmm. I'm getting ahead of myself. Right. So they fought, and um, and in early January 19, in, in late December, as you say, early January 1942, there was they were actually some of the very first soldiers in the American army in the American uh, forces to fight the Japanese in jungle war for anywhere uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was less than a month after Pearl Harbor, uh, and and they were um, they were already fighting and besting uh, the Japanese in jungle warfare. Right, yeah, and unfortunately, uh, for, and I just want the readers to know this, we're going to have to sadly skip over several um, clashes, conflicts, where, where you have technology on one side and uh, jungle smarts on the other. And some, there's some <laughs> amazing conflicts that go on, but unfortunately we're going to have to miss most of those. But if I could, and this is, this is to me, a small part of history, but, but it's important, um, so the Moros aren't given weapons, but they are resisting. They are fighting. This is their home island, after all. But what MacArthur doesn't know, and I maybe he doesn't ever know. I, I'm not really sure on that. Maybe you know. But they, because of their resistance, the Allies are able to hold on to Del Monte Field longer than expected, which, of course, is where a part, you know, one of the steps where MacArthur escapes. So, again, he has the Moros to thank for the fact that he was able to get off that island, whether he ever knew that or not, or maybe knew it later, I don't know. But, again, they're already making contributions to the war effort. 
Absolutely. Uh, they made a, a very significant difference, as I, I talk about in the book. The, mm. um, now, the regular battalions fought well, too. This is a place called Digos right. uh, on, the, on the eastern um, uh, shore of, of, uh, of Mindanao, uh, where, the, where, the, where the Japanese, uh, the, the early invasion force, um, uh, landed. Mm -hmm. the, the regular battalions fought well, but they were terribly hampered by equipment failures. Uh, their rifles were constantly jamming. Oh. Their mortar rounds almost never exploded. I mean, it was right. like, you know, eight out of 10 did not explode. Now, you don't have that kind of problem with swords, right? So um, right. Uh, what, the, what the Moros would do, the, these Sorry. Bolo battalions, is that they would, they would um, do these nightly forays into, mm -hmm. the, into the jungle, and they would attack uh, uh, outpo Japanese outposts, lone sentries, or attack ja Japanese patrols, right. sometimes leaving headless bodies behind. And, <sighs> and those attacks really sapped the morale of the, of the Japanese. They... The Japanese stopped patrolling. They rarely mm -hmm. strayed into the jungle. And the Japanese commander, a fellow named uh, Lieutenant Colonel Toshio Miura, uh, actually decided to wait for reinforcements instead of trying to complete his mission. Right. Uh, he was reportedly he was really uh, worried, uh, not just by what was going on right there, but by the prospect of thousands more uh, sword wielding moros in the interior of Mindanao yes. uh, uh, waiting for him um, to uh, to proceed further. Yeah. So part of their mission was to take um, Del Monte Airfield, which was this uh, important airfield that could land uh, B-17s, the only one in, in the Philippines other than uh, right outside Manila. Right. Um, uh, now, and so Mira's failure to capture that airfield uh, allowed uh, MacArthur to escape from there to Australia on a, on a B-17 in, uh, in March of 1942. Uh, it's not, it, it seems that because of the fog of war— um, MacArthur really didn't know the situation uh, in Digos. He didn't even know where Mira's troops were in Mindanao. All they knew really was that Del Monte Airfield was still open, mm -hmm. and uh, at least for the time being, and that he could uh, quickly escape from there, which is uh, what he did. Right. So he's not looking a gift horse in the mouth. He's just taking it. But we now know <laughs> right. it was because of their bravery, their tenacity. Um, exactly. It, Along with the equipment, and again, this is not something that I'm an expert in, but along with not getting equipment from the from the Americans from the West, um, they also weren't given quinine from malaria. And I lost count of the number of times that Adil and his men were sh struck and they had to rest for days right. and they were weak and, and just everything. So are the Americans maybe naively going, oh, well, they're locals. They don't need our medicine or they don't need this medicine. I'm sure they've got their own remedy. Or was it more of that we don't really trust you yet, so we're not going to help you too much yet? Well, probably a bit of both. But the, mm -hmm. the main problem was that uh, along with other equipment shortage, there was really a woeful shortage of quinine. There was just very oh, little of it. Gotcha. There were days at Digos, at this uh, Mindanao battlefront, mm -hmm. where more than 50 percent of the fighting force was down with malaria. So it, oh. it just uh, it was uh, horrible. Right. And my sense is that um, the quinine was reserved for American personnel only. So not only did the Moros not get it, but none of the none of the Filipinos, Filipino officers or men had access to it either. Right. Now, the, the interesting thing about um, uh, you, you talk about uh, having um uh, some protection against uh, natural protection against malaria. Mm -hmm. They they really the Moros had none. Uh, their um, malaria is, is a, in in Mindanao is a rainforest disease, and the rainforests were mostly in the higher elevations, such as uh, the mountains of Digos. Right. All the Moro uh, Moro volunteers were from the lowlands. They were from this great uh, uh, river valley to the west, and the rainforest had mostly been cleared in, in the lowlands. So the Moros who lived there for generations, uh, they had no natural protection and no medical protection against malaria. So they were hit very hard by it at Digos, yes. Wow, that's amazing. Now, um, we're, we're already 27 minutes into this, and I've only got four more hours worth of questions. This book was so, <laughs> no, but I, I won't do that to you. So, so the Japanese are trying to get to the interior of Bindanao. They launch their second major attack in April of 1942, and they start to do better. Things are not looking great for the Allies. And like, like you were saying, the Moros don't even have modern weapons. But 
Things are about to change. February 8, 1943, Cooter arrives at the uh, headquarters of the Mindanao guerrillas. You know, he's been invited there by Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Fertig, who has now recently been designated the military chief on Mindanao uh, for the guerrillas by uh, MacArthur himself. Could you tell us a little bit about Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Fertig, please? Sure. Uh, Wendell Fertig is... Um was the most prominent figure in the Mindanao guerrilla movement. And, wow. uh, and that movement uh, was the largest and most successful guerrilla movement in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Now, a good deal has already been uh, written about Fertig. Um, uh, he's either, he, he wrote a lot himself and, 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 and um, uh, other material has been written about him. And so that's one of the reasons why I, I sort of purposely did not make him a leading character in my sure. book, because my book is about the untold story of the uh, guerrilla movement in Mindanao. Right. But he is an interesting character. He was a mining engineer from eastern Colorado. Uh, he, he escaped a depression by finding work in the booming mining industry in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And he rapidly moved up uh, the ladder in his mining company. So by 1941, he was a high-level mining executive living a very affluent colonial lifestyle in Manila with his family, a, a, a lifestyle he never would have achieved if he had stayed in Colorado. Oh. Um, one year later, though, of course, 1942, his family had evacuated back to the States on the last ship out. Mm-hmm. And he um, had managed to get himself on the very last flight off Corregidor to Australia. Right. He was slated. He was in line um, to uh, fill a high-level position on the staff of MacArthur's chief engineer. So he had every reason to expect that he was going to be doing some really important uh, Mm -hmm. high-level war work um, at MacArthur's headquarters in in Brisbane, Australia. But his luck ran out on a a fueling stop in Mindanao when the plane he was on was damaged on takeoff and he was stranded for the duration. So there he was uh, stuck in Mindanao. And he decided not to surrender to the Japanese uh, when the surrender, American surrender happened in um, early May. And he then spent almost six months hiding out in the jungle, just hiding uh, from the Japanese. Mm-hmm. And other uh, unsurrendered, unsurrendered Americans started gathering around him. Uh, then he began to build a, a guerrilla organization, and he um, it got bigger. It got recognized by MacArthur, because uh, who he had managed to contact by radio. Mm-hmm. And MacArthur designated him, designated him the guerrilla chief of Mindanao. And then submarines began to deliver supplies. So then he was on his way. Um, he's he's inter- interesting also because he does not fit the Hollywood mold uh, for a guerrilla chief. He actually carried a briefcase. Uh, he spent and he spent most of his time in his office at his desk um, uh, during the war. So I make the point in the book that what what he seems to have done is simply transferred his uh, his business executive skills to right. a new setting. He was a very competent and very creative uh, organization builder and manager, but he was less capable at actual military skills. Um, Mm -hmm. He really had no military background except for ROTC in college. Uh, He set up, so for example, he set up this very impressive guerrilla enclave in Mindanao, and he called it the capital of the free Philippines. Right. But when the Japanese attacked it six months later, he really wasn't able to, to defend it. And in fact, he himself was surrounded by the Japanese, and he was only saved uh, by uh, a group of elite Moro fighters who had been recruited by Edward Cooter. And, <laughs> right. of course, he never credited them uh, for saving him. And one of the other uh, problems that uh, Furtick had um, it was that he spent an inordinate amount of time and energy on office politics. He, yes. he tended to be, to be petty and jealous. Uh, I mean, really, MacArthur-esque levels of, of <laughs> petty and jealousy. He was he was unwilling to give anyone else credit for anything, especially uh, if that someone else was not an American. Um, uh, and he uh, then was one of the main reasons why the Moros didn't receive uh, the credit that uh, I, I think they deserve for their wartime service. Yeah. Uh, oops, uh, I'll let the uh, readers decide on him. But yeah, he was yeah. definitely... Uh, an antagonist, uh, to my mind, you know, because like you were saying, if anybody, if there was a chance of anybody outshining him, uh, he would take steps to, uh, <laughs> to remedy right. that situation. That's right. So, 
So we're going to skip ahead a little bit because, and again, um, uh, Adele is fighting. His father didn't want him to fight. There's a lot going on, but of course we can only cover so much. So if I could, I'm going to ask you in a very general sense. So 1943, it's such a busy time, obviously everywhere because there's a world war, but certainly in and around Mindanao. And um, even though Adil is only 17, like you were saying earlier, you know he's going to end up fighting. He comes that's from right. this culture that's very proud, and they should be. There's Japanese all over the place. People are losing villages and lives. He's going to get involved, and even though his father doesn't want him to, he knows he needs to prepare his son for eventual combat. That's right. So when you... Um uh, w- when you think about the the timeline, um, mm-hmm. so his Muhammad Adil's father did not let his son fight in the Bolo battalions, uh, even though he was a strong supporter of the Americans, right. um, because he refused to let him face Japanese tanks and machine guns without firearms. He thought that yeah. was crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then when the Americans surrendered in May of 1942, Mm-hmm. He was astonished to see U.S. soldiers laying down their arms and marching into Japanese prison camps when they hadn't been defeated. Uh, and right. other Moros were just as astonished. This was this seemed like a, a tremendous violation of Muratabat, for example, right, mm-hmm. of their cultural ideal. Right. And, you know, um, there, you know, Mindanao was not Corregidor. They had not been defeated. And as you know, and, uh, and uh, some of your uh, listeners know, mm-hmm. um, Mindanao was the ideal place to continue uh, guerrilla warfare, and and preparations had been made for guerrilla warfare. Uh, yet here were the here were the American uh, and uh, other uh, and Filipino soldiers surrendering and march and laying down their arms and marching into uh, prison camps, and uh, the Moros really could not understand it. Now, of course, the Americans were following another sort of honor tradition, right? Uh, honorable mm-hmm. surrender to save lives. Except those lives were far away on Corregidor, right? It, it yes. really seemed to be the case that the Japanese were holding thousands of Americans, uh, including wounded American civilians, uh, hostage mm-hmm. uh, in order to um, force the surrender of all of the Philippines. They would only accept the surrender of all of the Philippines, including uh, far away Mindanao. So that was something that came that kept reappearing in your book, just the the clash of cultures, if you will. They just could not understand why the Americans, who had rifles in their hands that the Moros did not have, were surrendering. But you're right, they were following orders, they were trying to save the lives. Of course, we now know with hindsight that the Japanese had a different code when it comes to prisoners, and yes, it might have been yeah. better to not... Um, uh, not surrender, but but I wanted to ask you um, because this this goes right back to the moral co- the culture. What were some of the things that his father did to prepare him and to hopefully protect him from the battles that Adil would be would be getting involved in? Sure. Well, so again, first he sent his son to a safe place after the after the surrender, but then right. um, again when. When word of the guerrilla movement gets going and it seems like MacArthur may might actually return. And most importantly, uh-huh. when a, letters begin arriving from Edward Cooter, mm-hmm. he knows he, he knows he's no longer going to be able to hold his son back from going off to fight. So he does prepare him. And the first thing he does, is he gives him guns. Right. Because uh, uh, Adil Tambis had been collecting guns since the surrender, uh, mostly from soldiers uh, who were d- walking home and did not oh, right. uh, – the Japanese uh, did, did not want any evidence that they had uh, ever fought the Japanese. Uh, he had he had uh, collected guns and, and buried them. He he dug dug them up, some of them up, and gave them to his son. But he mm-hmm. also provides him with another kind of protection. He sends for a Sufi master to teach him the secret knowledge of uh, magical, uh, protective magic. Now mm-hmm. it's secret because it's only available to certain noble families. Um, uh, among the Moros. It's sort of handed down from, from generation to generation. Right. Now, these are spells, incantations, prayers uh, to paralyze your enemy, beguile your enemy. They're amulets and potions uh, to protect yourself from your enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, this this was uh, seven nights of, um, of uh, passing the secret knowledge on uh, to, to the young man. Wow. Now, uh, Muhammad Adil was naturally fearless, but he also told me that he was very, always very curious to test this magic, this protective <laughs> magic, to see if it actually worked. 
he was always pushing the limits yes. uh, in all of his encounters. Yeah. And now, now when he was, and the last thing his father did for him was when he was finally commissioned as a junior guerrilla officer, mm-hmm. his father sent his older kinsmen off uh, with him to guide him and protect him, and including one man who was a professional killer, who was a, probably a good person to have as your bodyguard. Right. And um, those older and more experienced fighters were usually able to dissuade him from taking things, taking too many risks, taking things too far in this testing of his protective magic, yes. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I lonesome. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now, only on MGM Plus. Yeah, and even without the magic, you remember being 17. You feel like you're invincible. Exactly. You can do anything, and so you'll try, but this is war. Yeah. Please don't do that. Yeah. Right. So the they, magic just adds a little uh, a little oomph to it. Yes. Yes, yes. So he's like, I can do this. So if you want to um, tell us about any of his earlier actions, we'd appreciate that. But I also wanted to hear about the Battle of Ta- Taparan, if I'm Tamparan, saying. yes. Tam- Tamparan, yeah. So uh, again, because I, I want to give the people a sense of some of the military clashes that were going on because even though we're dealing with what I think are incredible personalities, you know, it all comes down to resisting the Japanese. And so it's it's finally his time to get started helping with this. That's right. Let me um let me talk first about the Battle of Tamparan because Please. it's um it's it's rather unusual. Mm-hmm. And it actually came very early in the resistance and and um Okay. Um Muhammad Adil was not involved in, in that battle. He was uh, rather far away. But right. Edward Cooter uh, was a uh, not an eyewitness, but a witness uh, to that battle, and um, mm-hmm. uh, the only uh, the only chronicler in English uh, of that uh, contemporary chronicler of that battle. Right. Uh, so let me set the stage. It's it's uh, September of 1942. Uh, s- still early. The Americans had surrendered just four months earlier. Mm-hmm. Wendell Fertig was still hiding in the jungle. Uh, there was no uh, American-led guerrilla movement yet. MacArthur had no contact with the Philippines yet. He had no idea what was going on there. Wow. But there was one American, right, just one American, Edward Cooter, who was already mm-hmm. an active as an advisor and a witness to this extraordinary early uh, moral resistance um, to Japanese occupation. So when the Japanese... Um, at first reached uh, where Edward Cooter was at Lake Lanao in Mindanao, uh, mm-hmm. just north of where um, of where Muhammad Adil and his father lived. Um, he decided to go into hiding with moral friends rather than turn himself in uh, as mm-hmm. he was supposed to do. Right. Uh, now this is a Lake Lanao is a dramatic setting. So imagine a plateau uh, two thousand feet high, and in the middle of that plateau is this beautiful crystal blue lake twenty miles long. Uh, the plateau can only be reached by climbing steep jungled slopes and it's surrounded by rugged mountains. Mm -hmm. And then in that sort of, in that, um, remote, uh, very remote place, there are a hundred thousand Moros living in communities around the lake. So it almost has a lost world feel to it. Right. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And, and, and so into that lost world come the Japanese occupiers and they set up three Japanese garrisons Mm -hmm. around the lake. Uh, Edward Cooter in 1942, he's the only American in the whole province, and he's the sole eyewitness to this resistance. So what happens is that when the Japanese occupiers, the, the Japanese occupiers demand that uh, the Moros of Lake Lanao, right. that they surrender their guns and even uh, most of their bladed weapons. Mm. Well, that didn't go well. The Moros no. resisted. No. The Japanese publicly executed those they found with guns. The Moros retaliated, and then the cycle uh, just repeated itself. But mm-hmm. the most dramatic single uh, act of, of uh, moral resistance at that uh, I- around the lake was the Battle of Tamparan. Tamparan is a small town uh, right on the edge of the lake. And uh, w- one morning in September of 1942, a, a Japanese infantry company, 90 soldiers, arrive at the town in, in uh, motor launches at the town pier. They're looking for a moral resistance leader who, who's not even there anymore. 
but they begin firing uh, mortars uh, into a structure where they believe uh, the leader is uh, hiding. When the townspeople and, and then the, the villagers, the surrounding villagers, uh, the small villages around the town, hear the firing, they rush uh, towards uh, the firing and, and right into a hail of, uh, hail of bullets right. uh, and shrapnel. Uh, the large majority of those villagers are armed only with blades, no guns. Mm. Oh this God. happens to be the first morning of Ramadan, the holiest month of the Muslim calendar. It's a month wow. that uh, it's a very special month that celebrates selflessness and mutual aid for the whole right. month. So the reason people fast during uh, Muslims fast during Ramadan, and the mm -hmm. reason these particular people were fasting, uh, is in order to f in order to feel like what it feels to be poor and hungry, right? To have empathy for the poor. Uh, and they also, at the same time, they give alms, uh, they give aid to the poor mm -hmm. to, to kind of tamp down any community inequality and to build solidarity. So it's this real Smart. sense of, of yeah. community um, um, and, um, and selflessness happening there. It's, it's the worst possible time to attack a moral community. <laughs> That's what, yes, uh, yeah. yes. And, uh, and so imagine we're combining the, the, the idea of Murat Abad with this tremendous sense of selflessness that comes during Ramadan. And it just ensured that the community uh, would be defended at all costs, and it was. Right. So the Japanese soldiers are, are quickly surrounded on three sides uh, despite their superior weaponry. Eventually, they run out of ammunition, they break, they run for the pier and the boats, but they get mired down in the, in the lakeside marsh, and they're cut down one by one until 85 of the 90 soldiers are lying there dead in the mud. So it's a, it's a complete massacre. This was um, a defeat for the, for the Japanese army uh, right. that was really on a par with the Battle of the Little Bighorn, right? It was both improbable wow. and tremendously shameful. Even more shameful, I think, because of the of the um, uh, inequality of, of weaponry, um, and it was also, a, but it was also very costly uh, right. to Tamparan. Uh, more than two hundred villagers lost their lives in the battle as well. Um, this is a, a battle that, unlike um, Custer's Last Stand, uh, which is obviously famous, it, it remains almost unknown eighty years later. Uh, and, and again, Edward Cooter was the only one to write about it. Uh, at the time, uh, he wasn't an eyewitness, but he was told about it uh, immediately. So it's a really dramatic story mm -hmm. of um, of courage and sacrifice on the part of of uh, Moros. Right? It's an example of total resistance. Yes. Um, uh, but it's never been told. Yeah. Now That's there are a lot of rep repercussions from that from the Battle of Tamparan that right. I talk about in the book. But the broadest one and the most interesting one is that it led within three months to the Japanese occupiers of Lake Lano, essentially making a separate peace with the Moros, right? Oh. They, they stopped their demands to turn in weapons. They confined the sh soldiers to quarters, and they had right. standing orders not to do anything to antagonize, antagonize <laughs> the Moros in any way. Yes. It's really, really very, very remarkable, yeah. And, uh, and Cooter, who was, of course, always um, uh, looking uh, for, um, uh, always kind of aware of, how, uh, of the war effort, Right. Um, took advantage of that and then went around and started recruiting these these uh, Mora warriors who had just oh. essentially defeated the Japanese uh, to join Fertig's fledgling movement, which he had just made contact with. And the, now nice. these these fighters were willing to do it because their communities were now safe because they had this separate peace. So there's actually wow. a pretty direct line from this uh, Battle of Tamparan, which occurred you know essentially in this lost world. Uh, mm -hmm. And the success of the America, uh, American-led guerrilla movement. That is incredible. Yeah, but, um, yeah, they literally just bit off more than they can chew. Um, Pretty and, much. Yeah, now they're, they're paying. Because you I, I, and again, I find this fascinating. It's one of the things I, uh, I find fascinating about World War II is you can have all the technology you want, but at some point, some of your guys have got to go deep into a jungle, not have access to all that stuff, and take people on – you know, semi fairly even footing, and you know the locals. They know the territory. They know the terrain. They know everything about the the monsoons, the crocodiles. They know everything, and so you're <laughs> asking a lot uh, to go That's in right. there. Could I Absolutely get you to? Right. Could I get you to touch on? I'm probably going to say this wrong. The uh, the sinusat, the sinsuats. Sinsuats, yes, very so, good. Yeah, 
So some people did not resist the Japanese. They believed they saw the writing on the wall. Uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm guessing there. And, but for whatever reason, they joined up with the occupiers uh, to see you know, what could they get out of this. That's right. Uh, so there were a fair number of Moro leaders who are sort of local chieftains called Datus who mm. remained neutral during the war. You know, they, they took a wait and see stance. Um, uh, and then there were others, a uh, significant number of others who were, right. who were uh, openly pro-American, like uh, Muhammad Adil's father. But there mm. was one powerful uh, moral political clan that really went all in collaborating with the Japanese, uh, uh, with the Japanese occupiers. They right. actually met them at the dock when they arrived uh, in Mindanao. Uh, they supplied armed men for the police force. And they, they accompanied them on um, uh, raids against the guerrillas. Mm-hmm. And that was, a, that was a Sinsuat clan, and they were headed by Datu Sinsuat. Now, he was already in his late 60s or older. Uh, he was, um, and, but for most of his life, he had, he had, play, had to play second fiddle to another uh, powerful moral leader in his clan. But when the Japanese invaded, he saw his chance uh-huh. to become the most powerful moro in Mindanao, and he did. At, at least while the Jack, Japanese occupation uh, lasted. Mm-hmm. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, Muhammad Adil became his enemy. Yes. And, and uh, Sinswat tried to kill him more than once, which is interesting because Sinswat is also his father's second cousin. Um, but yeah. that's, as you know, how feuding sometimes works. It can be an intimate affair. And it, it was in that case, yes. Yes, family with families, it's always intense. Whether it's good or bad, it's it's always intense. Uh, now, again, we're going to have to some skip some stuff here, cause, but there's just so much I, w- I would love to talk about. But anyway, yeah. so it's it's October twentieth, nineteen forty four. The United States is ready to, you know, we're coming back to the Philippines. MacArthur's making his big return. However, at one point, MacArthur had an idea. Well, here's Mindanao. It's this big island. It's in the south. I'm going to use it. Uh, to help me launch my attack to take the rest of the Philippines. But then certain things change, and it turns out that Mindanao is going to be one of the last islands to be liberated. And so people like Adil and his family and his, his, his fellow warriors, they're going to be kind of on their own for a little longer than probably originally anticipated. That's right. Um, and it, it, what's interesting is that MacArthur apparently had always intended to return to the Philippines the same way he left, through Mindanao. Oh, gotcha. And, okay. and that made sense because it's an obvious stepping stone. If you, if you look at the path from Brisbane, Australia, to Manila, it's an obvious stepping stone through New Guinea and uh, up um, right. uh, up into uh, you know, towards Manila. Mm-hmm. It also had an airfield that can accommodate large planes, and it had the largest guerrilla movement in the Philippines. So it really did seem perfect. the perfect, perfect yeah. choice. Right. Mm-hmm. But at the last minute, right. everything changed because uh, Admiral Bull Halsey, uh, uh, flying over the um, over the central Philippines, uh, encountered su- surprisingly uh, light air resistance over Leyte, uh, wow. an, an island in the central Philippines, and mm-hmm. so uh, Leyte became the initial uh, landing spot for the invasion, and Mindanao went from first to absolute last. Uh, the people of Mindanao had to wait six uh, more months for their liberation. And then when the fight for Mindanao finally came, it was of a a different sort than it might have been, um, because now it was the last desperate stand of of Japanese troops, uh, and some of whom um, had actually uh, retreated south to 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 Mindanao Mm -hmm. and had been ordered— by their uh, by their uh, generals to hold out for as long as possible in order to uh, delay the Allied invasion of the Japanese home islands. Right. It's not like there's been a ton of rules for the Japanese soldiers all these years, and now they're truly being being told, hey, you are now guerrilla fighters, whatever it takes, hampen, you know, mess up, delay, whatever, the, the, uh, the allies, and if that means raiding villages as well. So it is exactly. truly a, a lawless island at this point, but a Dylan them are going to do everything they could. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about Mohammed's time with Battery B of the 
222nd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Searchlight Battalion because <laughs> even then, he's still a young kid, and most people don't know who he is. They don't know who his father is. And you stress this in the book. They have no idea at first how much experience this kid has got in taking on the enemy. That's right. It's a really a very interesting story. Um, so during the when the battle for Mindanao finally came, mm-hmm. when the American invasion of Mindanao came, uh, Muhammad Adil was a, was assigned to guide an American unit in the coastal highlands where he had been uh, patrolling for for much of the war. Right. And these this was a unit that was on a mission to seek out and destroy these last desperate Japanese uh, some of these last des- desperate Japanese holdouts. Mm-hmm. Now it's very late in the war and. Uh, there are a number of replacement units uh, that fought in Mindanao. Right. And one of those units was this battery of the 222nd uh, anti, Anti-Aircraft Artillery Searchlight Battalion, uh, long name. Uh, they were, <laughs> so this was a, a battalion originally formed in Southern California for coastal right. defense. Uh, the members of this battalion uh, had every right to think that they would never leave uh, the sunny shores of Southern California, yes. but they did get shipped out to New Guinea. But even in New Guinea, they they did almost nothing. They had they had no planes to spot. They were never right. under fire. Uh, they actually spotted only one enemy plane that was shot down, and that was a spotter plane, right. uh, not a, not a fighter plane. Yes. So, so again, here they are, uh, and then suddenly, right in June 1945, they find themselves transformed almost overnight into a frontline infantry unit engaged in jungle warfare, mm-hmm. for which they had no training at all, absolutely no training. Now, in their fir- very first a- action against the enemy, um, Adil wasn't with them yet. They had an, an unreliable local guide that's, that's uh, who right. leads them into a Japanese machine gun ambush. Two popular sergeants are killed. Mm. Other men are wounded. Right. Others are just crazed with fear and run through the jungle and stay yeah. and, and stay lost for days. So it was really a calamity, an absolute calamity. Um, Adil joins them two days later. Uh, and after that, the, the unit didn't lose uh, another man uh, killed or wounded. Uh, wow. But uh, Adil's, uh, at, at the same time, Adil's extremely frustrated because the commander of the battery, who, who's, who was absolutely intent on uh, not losing another another man, mm-hmm. or orders every patrol uh, to follow compass courses. Um, so very good at avoiding the enemy, but yes. not accomplishing the mission, which is, of course, to find and destroy the enemy. Right. Uh, Adil hates it. He says, you know, it's, it's the longest, it's the hardest. It's the first time ever in his life that he'd been tired after walking six miles, <laughs> right, because he's, it's just extremely difficult uh, yes. um, to, to do this. And, and um so finally, the commander changes his approach, and he offers two weeks' leave to anyone who can find the enemy and, and maintain contact long enough to call in an airstrike. Mm-hmm. Adil immediately volunteers. He takes his best men, and he follows a trail, no more compass course, a uh, trail yes. in the, where he knows the enemy is going to be, which is dug in on the side of the, the tallest mountain in the area. Mm-hmm. So they climb one ridge and then another one and another one. Um, they disarm Japanese booby traps, and they finally draw fire from a Japanese machine gun. One of his men is wounded. His uncle is wounded in the arm. It's the only bullet wound any of his men uh, received during the war. That that magic, that protective magic, was working right. pretty well. So yes. uh, they they knock out the machine gun nest and they uh, call in an airstrike on uh, on on this enemy encampment. Mm-hmm. And he witnesses for the first time this awesome might of American air power. Uh, you know, the days of rationing ammunition are over. He said it was just so extraordinary that that one call on a radio could bring down all of this destructive force. Um, wow. He was told, but he actually threw the smoke grenades to, to launch the, the to target the airstrike. And mm-hmm. he was told, stay down, stay down, because, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff flying around. But he got so excited uh, at, at watching this. That it was just like a, a Fourth of July. So he just he jumped up, and and he and his oh. men jumped up and down and yelled uh, uh, so hard that they were hoarse for days because this was a, a wonderful uh, moment for them. They were finally on the side uh, that had the overwhelming firepower. 
Yep. Can I just say real quick, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I almost picture this book already being made into a movie. And that's the <laughs> scene where I just picture this 17, 18 year old, uh, maybe he's 19 by now, I'm not sure, but scrawny kid jumping up and down with these huge explosions, you know, on the other side. And he's just because he's never seen this before. How could you not be excited? But of course, you and I know that for the Japanese, this is absolute hell that they're going through. But they're the ones who invaded in the first place. Right, right, and uh, I, I agree. I, I, that's a, I, it's a, it's I, 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 it's a climactic uh, moment in the in the yes. book that, that I really enjoy. So they, I, again, what is interesting about this this um, event is that uh, Battery B only accomplished mm-hmm. their mission because of him, because of right. Adil. Uh, yeah. Nevertheless, he received no official recognition at all. But he did get that two weeks leave, so uh, at least <laughs> so, he got something for it. <laughs> that's something. So, yeah. I, Mr. McKenna, I cannot tell you the number. I've lost times of the number of times he fell in love seeing all these different young, beautiful women because he's a young, good-looking guy. His Absolutely. father's a noble, so, you know, it'd be a pretty good catch. I've, I lost number uh, the number of times that he was supposed to die but <laughs> did not. So, obviously, that Sufi uh, man knew what he was doing. And I'm going to let... I'm going to let you decide um, where, how we end this, but because there is so much, there is so much we have not covered. But I do want to say before we go, uh, you met uh, uh, Adele, was it four times before he passed away? It, it, do I have that right? Oh, more than that, actually, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what was, I mean... I, even, obviously, by then he's a, he's an old man. He's an older man. Uh, I say that I'm an older man, but he 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 saw and did and lived through so much. I just imagine what it was like sitting with him and just someone who's got all these experiences under his belt. It must have been incredible. It really was. Uh, he was just a wonderful. Wonderful man, uh, a natural raconteur, uh, <laughs> extraordinary memory, um, right. uh, just uh, marvelous to be around. Also, an absolutely gracious host. I have so many fond memories of, of the time I spent at his home uh, in right. Mindanao, uh, enjoying his hospitality and the kindness and the wonderful cooking of his wife. I would mm-hmm. walk with him uh, across his lands. He had a he had he had farmlands and a creek running through his property and and of course nice. listening to his stories so um uh, and 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 traveling with him uh to to the old battle sites uh, was mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, um yeah i visited him i guess at least four times and would usually stay for for a week or two uh, each time and um uh, those were those were really good good years but actually, you know, my uh, if I can add, my most yeah. memorable moment didn't uh, occur in Mindanao, but actually in, in uh, Michigan at the Bentley Historical Library. And this is I'm going to go all I'm going to go researcher on you here. But um, uh, <laughs> that's a library that holds the papers of Edward Cooter and other American uh, colonial oh. officials. And this was the first time I'd been there. And um, I was looking at a classified document from 1943, mm-hmm. which was a product of uh, his debriefing when he, uh, he uh, Cooter uh, actually was evacuated in 1943 from the Philippines um, uh, for emergency surgery. He was very near death uh, with a liver abscess. And then he was debriefed at, at MacArthur's uh, headquarters. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the very end of that debrief document in the third appendix was a story that was written by Cooter to illustrate uh, the point he was making why the people of the Philippines were, would welcome an American invasion force, right? MacArthur and his staff were very oh, concerned about right. this. How, yeah. will, how, will, how will Filipinos welcome us? And so it was this very funny and very touching story about a, a moral boy who had punched another young man at, a school, at, at an assembly in the school auditorium because that young man had made a, a disparaging mark about Edward Cooter's bald head, <laughs> as, as seen from the back. Right. And, of course, it was, it was Muhammad Adil. Of course. Um, who was in, who was doing the same story, and it was exactly the same story that Adil had told me years earlier, with all the details the same, wow. down to the color of the suit worn by the men. So that that story just hit me like a lightning bolt, because it connected all the dots, right? It connected it mm-hmm. from past to present, from Mindanao to to Brisbane, and of course from Edward Cooter to to Adil. And uh, and when I I read it, I knew immediately that I, that now I had a book to write. Um, uh, because, it, you know, 
uh, Adil had never read Cooter's story. Cooter didn't even possess it. He wasn't allowed to bring any papers back from him. Oh, wow. um, so I was the first person to tell, to show Adil uh, that story and to let him know of its existence. And when I showed it to him, he was he read it with a lot of joy, but he wasn't surprised because he knew Edward Cooter and he knew that Cooter would remember that story right. and other stories about them and uh, about that friendship in the same way. Yeah, it was a wonderful I, moment. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm so jealous when I heard that you went back numerous times and just sat with him and talked and went places and you would record, you know, the, the information down. Oh, it was so incredible. Uh, but <laughs> Professor McKenna, I again. We have left out so much the various tribes, the infighting, the strategies, the big personalities, the little personalities, the cruelty, the, the kindness. There is so much in this book that we have not touched. But I do, I do want to end on this. When I read the very last page, I closed the book. I put it down. The only thought in my mind was, here is this man who saw everything from the Americans to the Japanese, everything in between the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. And was, was Adil still alive when Ferdinand Marcos left? Yes, he was. He yes. was. So, he, yes. so those were kind of the bookends of his life, you know, war and dictators and, and cruelty. But out of all of it, he, it sounds like he was able to carve out a pretty good life for himself and his family and in all that chaos. Oh uh, yes, uh, yes he was, and uh, and I would just uh, add that uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more of the 20s. Uh, this book ends in, in 1946. There's a lot more of the 20th century left, and <laughs> um, uh, I have another book in the works about uh, the rest of Muhammad Adil's life, and and that is nice. features a a 20 year uh, career in the Philippine military, where he fights out outlaws and pirates, and um, and then. Of course, right. uh, when he has to, um, uh, when he has to turn around and then and then uh, become a rebel general and uh, and fight the dictator uh, to protect his homeland. So it's uh, it's oh. uh, the story continues. Yeah, I don't care that it's not World War Two. When you finish <laughs> that book, I need you to come back on because I want to talk more about this guy. I, well, that's I mean, very nice of you. Thank you very I, much. But I think we all recognize when, when you're reading this book, I think we all recognize uh, the teenager in us. He was he was cocky. He was arrogant. He was ready to go. He was sure he could do anything. And there were times when some older men had to calm him down or he wouldn't have made it. But that's but, right. that, but that's what your friends and your uh, your your uh, what's colleagues are for to maybe, you know, be there when you're not making the best decision. But Professor McKenna, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for this book. For everyone else out there, it's uh, Moro Warrior, a Philippine chieftain, an American schoolmaster, and the untold story of the most remarkable resistance fighters of World War II in the Pacific. Professor McKenna, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.